Hi, I'm Leah Wheatholter, and this is the Investigation Game Podcast. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm Leah Wheatholter, CEO and founder of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Today I have with me Krista Pavey. Krista is a private investigator, entrepreneur, published author, and a public speaker. Spending the first half of her career as a chief operating officer of a multi-million dollar corporation, Krista decided to become an investigator and opened her firm in 2012. Krista helps people find peace of mind through seeking truth in their lives. She's been married for 28 years and has two successful and happy children. Krista specializes in missing persons persons, cold cases, sentence mitigation, criminal defense cases, and very selectively takes domestic casework. In private investigation, she is dedicated to helping her clients achieve success. She believes every case matters. She will fight for those who put their trust in her and her business. She believes investigative integrity is paramount to this successful outcome and takes tremendous pride in her work. Thank you for joining me today, Krista. Well, thank you for having me. So we've met a few times over the last maybe year or so, I think Mm -hmm. probably post- 2020. Yeah, so I think all of it has been. Yeah. So we've met a few times and I've always been fascinated by your work on missing persons cases, which is where I'd like to focus today. Um, But before we begin, will you share your story about why or how you decided to become a private investigator? You know, I I think I ask myself that question (laughs) every single day. Why did I do this? Um, How how did I, just why? Before um, I got into private investigation, I was working in the private sector, and um, I was a COO for a multi-million dollar company, and my life was kind of headed in one direction, and um, because of some unforeseen um, obstacles, I had to make a change, so quite literally a midlife crisis. But my experience in my former industry uh, gave me a skill set that I thought might be useful in the investigation industry, and it's something I'd always been attracted to. So I just thought, well, if not now, then will I ever try it? And so I just, I just did it. You just made the leap. I just literally was. I'm, I think I want to be a PI, and I think I can. And so I, I had no clue like what the work was actually going to be like but I had a lot of experience um, running a business so I think a lot of people get into the investigation industry and they have a lot of investigation skills but they don't necessarily have the business and marketing side and so it's um it's something if you're a teachable person that you can learn and so I felt like that I could learn what I needed to and I feel like I have so here I am yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Which thank you. I think that's actually how I found you was your marketing because oh, your wait. marketing was under Spy Girl, yeah, like Tulsa was, Spy Girl, yeah. and. I just really I remember the day that you said, "Oh, let's meet up," which because yeah. you had heard me on the PI Perspectives podcast, I, I think, mm-hmm. and then around the same time, I just reached out to you, which was crazy, so weird, and. Um, so anyway, I just really loved whenever I got to tell my husband, like, oh, hey, I'm going to go meet with Spy Girl today. So that just, like, made my um, You know, I probably should be Spy Woman because of my age, but I have a really common name. And, I, you know, when I started out, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm the only, I'm really the only person in the world with my name. And so I was a little bit apprehensive about that, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to put out for marketing, and mm-hmm. I had... A call one day and the and the caller just says hey are you that spy girl and I was like well yes I am so I, love it. I just put it on my Facebook page and I'm almost I'm I'm almost to 10,000 followers which I'm super stoked wow. about so I've kind of not been working really hard at it but lately I'm like okay I, I need to get past that 10 yes. you know so yeah, you do well, hopefully, so if anybody listening, you need to go out and find, so this is on your Facebook page? Mm-hmm. Right, And yes. what's your Facebook page? A spy Girl at Tulsa Private Investigation. Okay, so we need to go out and help push Krista over this 10,000 yes, followers. Please, yeah, that would be so great. Right. In Oklahoma, what did that process look like for you to go get your PI license? When you made this decision? So, you have to have cleat training, which is like a, it's 
basically three to four phases, depending on whether you want to do security or not. You know, it's very it's very basic. So you have to spend extra time taking courses and educating yourself. And I knew from um, coming from a family of entrepreneurs that the one of the best ways to learn is to study under somebody that does it well. And so I just found really, really excellent mentorship. And um, man, I put in a lot, a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of work. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And it's like a several week um, course, right. I think. And, right. Yeah. And then like a test. At the I mean, the first something. like is just general. And then like phase three, phase one is general. Phase three is... Um, investigative stuff, yeah. um, and I, I'm sure that's what it's called, like, in the course Yeah, work. I think it's called, Investigative like, stuff. Oh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah like, yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah. but, um, no, um, and then phase four is, um, you know, your carry class, and yeah. so, all that stuff you have to do, all the boxes you have to check, then you have to test out, and you have to go through all the backgrounds, and get your agency, and all of that stuff, so, did all of that. But I would agree that once you get that license, you still don't know what you're doing. Well... <laughs> The, so everybody was like, oh my gosh, the, I could do that. It doesn't sound very hard. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like it's not. going through the coursework isn't hard. Um, running and managing an agency and putting out quality work and being able to work in this industry is really, really hard. Right. So sure, you know, the training might not be super hard. It's really not hard at all, but um to survive is a completely different story. And I'm, I'm, at, I'm at my 10th year this year. So oh, congratulations. I'm really excited about that. I know. I saw on Google the other day, because, um, you know, I have to check every now and then, mm-hmm. like, Forensic Accounting Tulsa and make sure I'm still in the organic, right, right, top right. organic links right. and all that I stuff. I see you, right? too. I see you, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And um, they give you kind of a little, like, nod when you pass that 10-year mark. Like, they'll put 10-plus years or whatever, like, I on mean, your... thank you, Google. I know, I mean, right? For thinking of just me but um, I thought, no I I, that. it is exciting though I I mean it's right. it's huge it's a huge accomplishment for me it's so huge I'm I'm just so grateful for the clients that have entrusted you know their casework to me I'm so grateful for my family who supported me and for my colleagues who have been there for me you know it's just been it's been a wonderful experience That's tough awesome. but wonderful Oh, yeah, for sure. I get it. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know, like, if I knew everything I knew 10 years ago, I would probably say, there is no way you're doing this. Like, <laughs> you you yeah. are nuts. Some things. <laughs> yeah. Some things I would right? agree as well. <laughs> I know, we're hitting 12 years this year, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, so what kind of cases or types of cases do you work in your practice? Well, you know, when you start out, you just take any, you know, like sure. anything reasonable. I'm not saying anything, because you always have people that ask you to do ridiculous things or illegal things or whatever but yeah. you take anything reasonable but now the last several years my practice has been more focused on criminal casework um, I'm an investigator for the innocence project so I love post-conviction work mm-hmm. um, I do a lot of criminal defense in Oklahoma we're kind of unique because we had a big ruling in 2020 with the McGirt decision and so um, that's changed kind of a lot of things and so I've gotten a lot of McGirt cases um, so I really love that I still take some domestic casework if it's interesting to me um, but really only if it's interesting to me um, I'm not gonna turn down you know an interesting cheater case or right you know and I love research so anything fraud or research you know research based fraud genealogy that's all in my wheelhouse um, so yeah that's and and of course missing persons yeah working cold cases yeah so cool yeah it's kind of my cup of tea so yeah 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 so let's talk about the missing persons cases well actually let's let's go back okay. let's go back just okay, a little okay. bit what were the first kinds of cases because if somebody has never done this work before you said anything that's reasonable <laughs> but like okay, what did some I, of those I, reasonable I, things look like so i don't think my first case was reasonable but i do have to bring it up because there were some cookies being stolen from a cookie factory like <laughs> and so, yeah actual like, cookies yeah like somebody stole okay. the cookie from a cookie jar right, right, right. i sometimes nickname my cases so you know like that's the you know so anyways yeah like there were there were really 
pallets and pallets of cookies being stolen. And I had a lot of experience in in in-house surveillance. So we were able to go in. It was very much in my wheelhouse. I looked, you know, really awesome after that. I'm like, well, you know, here's, you know, what you need to, you know, redo and what you need to change. And sure enough, they were able to, you know, figure out who the who the cookie thief was but um, was it an inside job it was an inside job okay. inside the cookie factory and it was not a mouse um <laughs> it was a yeah it was a person how, yeah. how are they getting like all these pallets of cookies out um, like, they just, just, just didn't, the truck up? yeah they just their, their cameras were pointed all willy-nilly you know i mean and and they didn't have they didn't have a good system of how they would check people in and out of the facility. I mean, it's kind of basic security okay. stuff, yeah. like, really, yeah. actually. But it was kind of fun, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a fun tester case. And I was I was scared I was going to get, like, something very serious that I wouldn't be able to, you know, handle. But um, that came quickly enough. One of my first cases was a missing persons case. I can't really discuss the details of that case in particular. But I guess in all of my decision making to becoming a, to become an investigator I never really thought much about uh, missing persons until one landed on my desk and then as you know a lot bubbled over for me in that mm-hmm. area and I was like oh wow you know maybe I could really make a difference I understand what these people are going through so yeah like yeah so this case showed up for right. you mm-hmm. and then do you want to talk about why that yeah important? so um, I sat down with the family and right away uh, the mother was like you know this person is missing and my children are distraught and then I just it just all you know I mean I there are things that you go through in your childhood that you just kind of put out of your mind but you know when I was 12 my sister went missing and she was missing for over a year And so I don't know why when I was thinking about doing investigative work, I never really thought about missing persons. Mm -hmm. I was on more of a research trajectory and I had done some work dealing with criminal elements. So I was more focused in that area. But then the first missing persons case that landed on my desk, I was like, wow, you know, these people need help. I can relate maybe I could make a difference here. Mm -hmm. And then I just, that's what I set out to do. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So I want to get into the details of missing persons, but first let's take a quick break. We love fun projects around here at Workman Forensics, and our newest adventure is taking place in the form of an escape room. Novel Mysteries is our first escape experience based on the novel Blood on the Mother Road, No Place to Hide by Tulsa author Mary Coley, the 2022 Oklahoma Book Award for Fiction recipient. Booking opportunities for this exciting immersive experience are available at novelmysteries.com. So welcome back to my conversation with Krista. Krista, how did you start learning about investigation processes and steps? You know that I'm really big on investigation processes, the data sleuth process. So, like, how did you learn what that type of investigation would even look like for investigating missing persons? I mean, really wonderful mentorship, one. Um, I just... You know, if, if you know that you have things to learn, don't be afraid to ask and find somebody... You know, surround yourself with people that are better than you and and work towards, you know, their level of expertise. And so um, I found great mentorship, one. And then the other thing I did was I became involved with people that were... And it, well, let me just say that people say that once you have a missing person in your family or you work with missing people, you're... A part of the club and it's a club that nobody wants to be a part of mm. and so I was a part of a club I didn't know that I that I didn't want to be a part of it that shouldn't you know, I, mm. it's terrible it exists but um, when you start volunteering when I say volunteering I worked with a lot of, I, and I still do work with a lot of groups that specialize in search um, some in search some in search and rescue there is a little differentiation there um, some do search support rescue but um you know that most of them have and well really all of them that I work with have SAR training and and um so you know really boots on the ground getting out and and um searching for people um but also understanding that you know there is a process and 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 anytime you start on a missing persons case you don't just start from when somebody makes a call and says this person is missing or you know you 
you, you have to start before they went missing. Like, what was their story leading up to this? You can't assume anything. The biggest thing I would tell people working missing persons cases is don't make assumptions. We do that all the time as an industry, law enforcement does it, and and, it, and for good reason, because most of the time it's a, what it's gonna be, you know? I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's um, the simplest answer is, is usually the right answer, and so it's easy to make assumptions. But those cases that don't get solved, mm-hmm. a lot of times are because you made an assumption that it's just like, oh, she's just a runaway. You know, he just needed some time to himself. He's a grown right. man. He can leave if he wants to. And you say those things and you make those assumptions and then you've lost time. And so then you have to go back and try to build a timeline when you've lost time. And that's difficult sometimes. So, mm-hmm. But you have, to, you have to do all of those things. If you are an investigator and you're getting a case a week after law enforcement, even if they've interviewed people, even if they've built a timeline, you, you should do all of those things on your own because you never know. It may be... You see something, somebody that you're interviewing remembers something. Maybe they were scared to talk to law enforcement and they're more willing to open up to uh, somebody in the private industry. So rewalk all of those steps Mm -hmm. and um, see, you know, where the information leads you, not where your assumptions lead you. That's really what you have to do. And the community getting the information out there, this person's missing, you know, um, can you, you know, build relationships in the community. You know, I can have a missing fire made in less than an hour. I can have search teams on the go if we feel like the person is in a distressed situation, you know, so... So you mentioned search and rescue training and these search and rescue teams or mm-hmm. people that can help you. Right. Where Who provides that type of search and rescue training? Um, so the national organization is SAR. And, and um, all of the teams that I work with are actually, they go through lots and lots. It's, it's actually a lot of training for volunteer work. Okay. So you just have mm-hmm. to really... Be so thankful for these people. Um, one organization that I've I've worked with and their their folks for a long time is Bridging the Gap. Um, they've got some excellent search search people. Oklahoma Search and Rescue Council out of Oklahoma City. Um, they're fantastic. Um, it's building relationships with people because every missing person case is different. I take in a lot of casework where they haven't even filed a missing persons case yet because they're not sh- like they haven't gone to law enforcement. They're not sure if their person is missing yet. So mm-hmm. the initial investigation is, hey, can you go see if our person's okay and if they're not where they're supposed to be? Mm-hmm. Something's wrong, and then you walk them through the steps of how to file. Um, some people call us a week later. Um, either law enforcement's doing something or they don't feel like they're doing something can you assist us and then there are people that just absolutely cannot afford help but you know they're in a very serious traumatic situation and we try to step in and help those people too yeah so the search and rescue volunteers that you're talking about so a lot of these search teams that we might see or hear about on the news a lot of them are volunteers most of them are volunteers and I would say a good portion of them have um, decided to to um, be on a search team because they have somebody in their life that's gone missing, which is what's really crazy. I mean, I went on a search. um, I believe it was in 2019, and I was. I think we were in. Well, we were. I know we were in Delaware County, and (laughs) there was a line of cars, and I walked up, and I and. One of uh, my search buddies was like, you know, Krista, I want you to meet so-and-so. Their person is, you know, this missing person. And, and you know, it's just heartbreaking. Wow. You walk down a line of cars and you realize that almost everybody in one of those cars has a family member that is now considered a cold case. And they're out there, boots on the ground. Helping find some looking cases. for somebody else's family because they don't want them to feel the way that they feel. Yeah, well, it's absolutely astounding. Yeah. Um, so um, once you ever get involved, it's hard to um, to distance yourself from it because of the community for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, what are some of the techniques? Like, I'm I'm kind of curious. You know, what are what are some of the techniques that maybe you've learned at these trainings? Just a, just a few of them that maybe yeah. we wouldn't think about if we've never, you know, if a listener and myself, I've never done a search. You know, maybe what's some, a technique or something to consider on these searches that you wouldn't have thought before before you started doing the searches? So, 
um, my role, and, and I've, I've done the physical searching part, mm-hmm. um, but when, when I volunteer, I'm looking for where's, where's my best fit. And so for me, a lot of times I work with the family. You know, a lot of times family want to go out and search. Mm-hmm. Well, if you think that their person is deceased, you yes. don't want to walk them into yeah. the woods where, yeah. you know, so, you know, we kind of manage the family. Um, that's something I'm good at. I'm good at working with the family and managing mm-hmm. the family. A lot of times, um, you know, our searchers will call me and say, okay, you know, I need you to pull up directions. I need you to talk to this property owner. We need to go on this property. Can we get permission? I mean, there's all just all different roles, but I have done the physical searching and I'm telling you once that you've literally looked in drains and culverts and it's, it's crazy, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's scat, sad and sometimes it's scary. Um, but somebody has, somebody has somebody to has do, to do it. it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so um, on these searches, I'm, we didn't talk about talking about this, yeah, so no, you can okay. just say it's skip okay. it if yeah, you want. No, it's okay. But um, like on the searches, if you did find something, is that part of the training too? Like as part of a evidence recovery and, you and have things to, like that, right? Yeah, right. So you don't want people out on your searches that obviously don't have the training um, to to either um, they either have to have a lead or you know, they don't need to be involved because we have to be very careful preserving evidence. It does not do us any good to find somebody's remains and then have, you know, a family member or somebody amateur walking all over the crime scene. Right. So um, that's why we prefer to take small groups of trained individuals. Um, We try to keep the family at bay, Um, not because we don't want them to help. I mean, we obviously... Uh, always want family to feel like that they're a part, but you, again, don't want to, tra- you know, even, even further traumatize somebody or um, disturb a crime scene. So right, for very, sure. very particular about those things. Um, uh, and like I say, you know, all these folks that are on these, um, on these teams are just really, really highly skilled and excellent. And uh, most of them law enforcement utilizes, they'll call them out when there's a critical missing and Mm -hmm. um so you know you know when law enforcement's calling you to come out then they're not worried about you you know disturbing a crime scene (laughs) but you know i mean you do see on tv all these and they've got you know a hundred people and i mean yeah so but that's not realistic i mean sometimes there are times where you get a lot of people show up but like i say you have to in that situation you have to have team leads and you have to be it's just it takes a lot more work because you have to be extremely diligent to make sure that nobody's again you know doing something that might disturb a crime scene because you don't you only get one shot right one yeah. shot right and so that's not anything we want to um, be a part of you know you, you want people to have justice of something sure. nefarious has happened so um, so obviously there's searches where you may find someone who's deceased Uh but then there's also searches for missing persons where i'm assuming they are a lot more people alive okay yeah yeah Yeah, i mean which great you know right what we're hoping and but you don't ever hear those stories you know i know (laughs) so um you know i mean i i I find a lot of people alive you know so um which is good news right (laughs) Um, Right. so i guess in my mind when you're talking about search search teams specifically it seems like you know, we're going to go into the woods and do this whole but thing. You, but, but, then, but they get called out on those type of cases, yeah. though, you know. Yeah. What I take into my practice, I mean, I you know, I'm a, not a nonprofit. And anybody right. that starts looking into missing cases and you just start volunteering and volunteering and you're not making any money, you're doing it the wrong way, okay? Like, right. we, we are, unless you want to open a nonprofit, and then awesome, great for you. But, you know, I'm a for-profit organization, so most of my time has to be dedicated to for-profit work. That does not mean that I will not do some right. nonprofit work, but it cannot dominate mm-hmm. the majority of my time. Um, but, you know, I do have a heart, you know. <laughs> right. and, and I do know that there are a lot of people that need help, that can't afford it. So, um, if you get your business in a place that you can, then you should. Mm-hmm. You should spend some time donating and and um, helping people because I know a lot of people that listen to this podcast 
have the skill set. So right, right. And, and I think that there's like this interesting balance too because when I first started Workman Forensics, um, I was trying to find a way to get some more experience because my goal was if I can just work more cases than anyone else, right. paid or unpaid, I'm going to have more experience, which is going to lead to more paid engagements. And that's how right? that's so, what I said in the beginning as well. Like so, I whatever I can get my hands on, right. But, so um, I think it was maybe year three or four of my practice, I then started volunteering with T- uh, Tulsa Police Department in their financial crimes unit uh-huh. and just working on, I just worked on embezzlements. Right. But, I mean, I just got better. I understood what law enforcement wanted out of my reports. There was a lot that came right. from that that I don't think I would have gotten had I not, you know, volunteered. So I think there's like a really nice balance. But then I got too busy right. to do that work. And then... Like a couple years ago, we started volunteering again. So I think it can be like a nice. It's funny because anytime anybody asks me, you know, I want to be a private investigator. That sounds so fun. I tell them, okay, well, first, let me tell you, your first several years, you're going to work a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot, lot. Yes. And not only that, you're going to be working when other people want to be at the dinner table. And so you have to make a lot of sacrifices. My family's made a lot of sacrifices for me to have this career and to be where I am right now. Um, I worked one particular case with a missing autistic baby, seven, eight years old. And, um, you know, uh, we just had to, I had to make the decision whether to stay on Father's Day or not. And it literally was so crushing, but, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's a missing child and I was with my team and what do I do so um you know it's hard for me to give up holidays it's hard for me to give up family time but in that particular instance you know it was what I needed to do and Mm -hmm. so this is not an easy job um missing persons casework especially if it um somebody's missing for a nefarious reason and if there's foul play involved can be very dangerous One of the most difficult things about working those types of cases is about knowing to know when you're in danger and knowing when you need to not push beyond where you're at, um, to know how to communicate with law enforcement in the right way. I mean, there's a whole, whole lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And there have been investigators that have gotten themselves hurt because... They just didn't know their limits. Um, So if somebody makes one person go missing, they're not afraid to make somebody else go missing. Right. That's the reality. Right. And so you just got to have a little bit of emotional intelligence and know, you know, what's okay and what's not okay. And how would the family feel if somebody else ended up in a bad situation? Like, take that into consideration, too. So, Right. So to do a search for missing persons you know so we talked about that but if it's not suspected or if i guess what types of other searches do you do besides literal boots on the ground to look for a missing person maybe using technology or social media right so um i mean you you get everything from just like stuff we all do general locates like I, you know so and so isn't paying child support to you know, I haven't talked to my birth dad. I mean, those aren't not really missing people, but you're still finding people. Sure, yeah. Um, but then um, when it start, you know, but I, I get a lot of calls for people that have um, adult children or adult family members who are either mentally ill or they're addicts. And so they know that they're alive, but they haven't heard from them. Maybe they didn't check in over Christmas or on a birthday or, okay. you know, they, they've fallen out of some typical habit mm-hmm. and then they'll call us, hey, you know, we need to see if this person's okay. Um, we need to see if, you know, we need to file a missing persons report. I do a lot of missing mentally ill adults. Interesting. Um, that's a whole nother like episode of a podcast about mental health and homelessness. And, but I've developed, you know, you've, it, the other thing I tell people is know your, know your area, know Mm -hmm. your city, know your state. I mean, I know so many homeless people, like I'm friends with a lot, a lot of homeless people. I know their stories. They know me. Mm -hmm. If I'm concerned that somebody 
is missing, you know, and they're homeless, I have people I can talk to yeah. in the community that's taken a long time for me to nurture. And honestly, it's been such a blessing getting to know mm -hmm. so many of these folks. So my job is rewarding in a million ways, and that is one of them. But um, know your community, understand um, the people that you're looking for, you know, understand the illness. You know, somebody says, my missing person is schizophrenic. If you don't understand schizophrenia, spend some time studying, you know, mm -hmm. like understand, like it's going to help you understand their behavior. It's going to help you find them, you know, right. um, talk to their family, talk about, you know, their likes and dislikes and what their quirks are and the things that they will do and the things that they would never do. And it's the same thing for people that fall into addiction. You know, what will they do? What will they not do? I, you know, what drugs are they using? You know, what, it, when they usually, you know, get into deep, like, what does that look like in the past? You know, so a lot of the, and then, and then you have silver alerts. Um, you have a lot of folks that their parents are falling into dementia, but they're, you know, not really sure yet if they should take the car or the car keys and right. they're just kind of teetering. And then, you know, then, you know, they're missing and that's a whole interesting dynamic, how you look for people that, you know, that are falling into dementia. They have some patterns and habits, just like autistic children have patterns and habits. They're attracted to water. Um, dementia patients will a lot of times visit places that they remember from their past. So, sure. you know, there are just different things that you have to know about um, each different type of person that goes missing. And so. All right. So thank you so much for taking time to talk with me no, today. Thank you. And um, to share your experience and stories. So if any of our listeners would like to connect with you, what's the best way to do so? Okay. So um, again, follow, my, uh, follow, follow you, follow me, Spy Girl at Tulsa Private Investigation um, on Facebook. Uh, I'm the real Spy Girl on Instagram and Twitter. My website is TulsaPrivateInvestigation.com. Um, my phone number's on all of those. You can reach out to me, um, talk to me. Okay. You know. Well, thanks so much. Well, Whatever. hopefully you'll get a, you'll cross over right, that I'll ten thousand. over that ten thousand. Yeah, I said I was gonna do it this summer, so. Well, we'll maybe this will maybe help you do that. This will, this will be the thing, right? That's right. So, All right. Well, thank you so much, Krista. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Investigation Game podcast. For more information on any of the topics brought up on this show, visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoyed our show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also connect with us on any social media platform by searching Workman Forensics. If you want to learn more about using data and forensic accounting engagements and fraud investigations, make sure to check out my book, Data Sleuth, available on Amazon or anywhere else you like to buy your books.